Uh, hi, I'm Lucien Hardy. I work at Perimeter Institute. Today I'm going to be discussing quantum theory, quantum gravity, and indefinite causal structure. Over to you, Vishnu. Thank you, Dr. Hardy, for uh, appearing on the podcast. You're welcome. So, to begin with, uh, can you lay the groundwork uh, of the problem of the quantum gravity? Okay, so put simply, the problem of quantum gravity is to find uh, a, a, a theory, uh, probably a new theory, which reduces in appropriate limits to Einstein's theory of general relativity on the one hand, and to quantum theory uh, on the other hand. So I, I should probably unpack that statement a little bit. Um, so general relativity is Einstein's uh, theory of gravity. He developed it in, in the years leading up to 2015, uh, and it followed on from his theory of special relativity. Um, and um, you know, in order to develop a theory, really, it was uh, in some ways perhaps the most spectacular uh, feat, um, um, academic intellectual feat, uh, by any one individual in, in, in the history of human thought. Um, he had to really re, re, re think think differently about the way space and time worked. Uh, not only uh, was space and time unified, as in special relativity but space and time could actually uh, bend. Uh, so it's a very, it's a very beautiful, uh, very striking theory. Um, and it is in its own way quite, um, uh, quite conceptually uh, novel, quite strange. Uh, so that's general relativity on the one hand, uh, Einstein's theory of, um, of, of gravity. And then on the other hand, we have um, quantum theory. So quantum theory was developed uh, by a bunch of different people, um, uh, Planck usually regarded as the person who got the ball rolling uh, with his theory of black body radiation. And then there were many contributions, including actually by Einstein, uh, leading up to um, contributions by uh, Heisenberg and Schrodinger, who, who in some sense were the, the people who really um, put, put, wrote down you know, the, the quantum theory in its modern form for the first time. In fact, we're coming up now to the 100 years, 100, 100 years of uh, quantum theory. Uh, so it was 1925 that uh, Heisenberg wrote his paper, so almost 100 years ago. Um, and quantum theory is is a very strange theory. It, it's conceptually uh, very odd. It, it really puts the um, it puts measurements at the center. It puts the observer uh, at the center of what's happening. So it, it's it's a it's a very strange theory. Perhaps the strangest thing in quantum theory is the phenomena of quantum interference. So in quantum theory, you can imagine a particle can get from A to B. It can go by one path or, or by another path. Uh, and what happens there is, is that there is a sense in which it goes along both paths at the same time. Um, quantum theory, you get this weird thing called quantum superposition, and it leads to an experimental phenomenon called quantum interference. Uh, and from that, you infer that a particle is taking one or two paths at the same time. So, so you've got these two theories. Um, quantum theory and general relativity, um, and the problem of quantum gravity is to find a new theory that, that limits to those two theories in appropriate limits. Uh, so what I mean by that is you might imagine that general relativity, in certain experiments you would expect to see Einstein's theory of general relativity uh, um, hold up, and in other kinds of experiments you'd expect to see quantum theory hold up, and then there will be experiments where Neither of them would work precisely, perhaps, but you'd get a new domain where, where, you're, ex where you're really doing a quantum gravity experiment. And, and the problem is that these two different theories are, are conceptually very different. They, they make very different concept uh, assumptions about the way the world works. Uh, and so it's hard. It's hard to find a theory that, that, that um, reduces inappropriate limits to those two different theories. And people have been working on it now for a, a long time. Uh, uh, and... Um, and, and that's that's the problem I'm I'm uh, fascinated by. So I've always been curious about this question. Um, now, uh, as far as I understand, we have uh, strong quantum theories of many other forces, including like electromagnetism, for example, uh, the weak force, the strong force. Why is why is gravity the odd one out? I think the best answer to that is that gravity is about the very fabric of space-time. Um, those other theories 
we postulate particles that live on top of space-time, but, but take well, those other forces. You imagine fields that live on top of space-time, but take but take space-time to be a fixed structure. Whereas whereas general relativity, space-time itself is something that's dynamical. Um, now you can cheat a little bit and imagine small perturbations in space-time. Uh, and, and you can treat that as if you have some fixed background space-time structure with little perturbations on top of it. Uh, and then it behaves a lot like the theories you mentioned. Uh, but if you get into something which doesn't, doesn't fit that perturbative framework, if you have strong perturbations, then it, it, it starts to break down. So, so there's something very different about um, quantum theory uh, compared with these other theories. That, that, that's, that's my opinion. You'll, 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 you'll get, people have different opinions on this, but that's, that's my feeling. And, and there's something even a bit stranger, um, which is how to explain this. Um, in general relativity, um, what happens is that your equations are invariant under coordinate transformations. So what do I mean by that? Um, you, you lay down some coordinate system, you know, you, you, we used to coordinate systems, so you have X, Y, and Z, and also in general relativity, you also have T, you have X, Y, Z, and T. Um, and um, so we're used to that kind of idea. But in, in general relativity, you have a structure that is, is prior to space and time, it's called a manifold, and you, you put space and time on top of that structure, uh, and, and you do that by specifying something called a, a metric. It gives this manifold, which is a prior structure, it gives it um, gives it spatial temporal structure, and um, but that manifold before you put anything on top of it, you you have to put some coordinates down, okay, to describe you know you've got this point or that point or another point, and um, and then you write down some equations, and your equa your equations uh, don't really care how you put those coordinates down. You get you have this, the equations have the same form regardless. And this ends up meaning that, th that those coordinates you put down have no intrinsic meaning in themselves. Uh, you only get meaning in, in general relativity by looking at the values of physical quantities um, uh, in reference to one another. So it's a kind of relational thing that physical quantities, uh, fields that live on, on, this, on this background structure, this manifold, uh, uh, take values in, in, relative to one another. And, and that's where you get the physical meaning. The, the coordinate system you place down in the first place has no meaning in itself. Uh, and this was something that that, um, that Einstein struggled with. It was one of the reasons for, it, for, for him, um, you know, taking his time to get to his, his, his field equations. It took him a while because he struggled uh, with, with this problem that um, the, the background structure, that the coordinates were not really intrinsic. They were, that they didn't have real meaning in themselves. It was only is relative values of coordinate of, of physical quantities that mattered. So, um, so, so that that's um, uh, uh, that's something quite different as well. I see. Um, and so, you've taken a fascinating approach to this issue. Uh, in two thousand and one, you formulated all of quantum theory, starting from five uh, axioms. I believe you call this an operational approach because of the fact that uh, it only considers these physical quantities which you can measure. Um, and it doesn't, I guess, postulate about what exists in the world. Um, uh, so in layman's terms, what are these axioms and how do they uh, tie into the problem of unifying quantum theory with general relativity? Okay, um, so... So there's a few things I'd like to address there. I'd like to mention, talk about what I mean by operationalism. Um, I'd like to tell you what the axioms are. And then um, I should also mention that, you know, the time I did this work, I, I wasn't interested, especially in the problem of quantum gravity. That's an interest that uh, came along for me um, later, especially when I moved from Oxford to the Perimeter Institute. Um, so operationalism. Operationalism is is like you say, it's looking just at quantities we observe. Uh, well, it's a, bit, it's a bit more than that. You know, when, when we do experiments, we, 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 we choose different settings and then we make observations. So there's, there's, the, there's the things we do and then there's the observations we make and operationalism concerns um, describing the world at that very basic level in terms of what we do and what we see. 
uh, and just attempting to make predictions um, in, in that context without positing necessarily some some deeper level of reality. It's it, you can either regard operationalism as 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 something fundamental. You might say, well, there isn't any reality beyond what we do and what we see. Um, or you might say operationalism is, is a methodology. It's, um, it, it's a way of extracting the essential physics without getting misled by some preconceived notions about an underlying reality. So a, an example of the success of operationalism was, uh, again, back to Einstein when he set up the theory of special relativity. Uh, and there was, a, at the time, there was this preconceived, preconceived notion of an absolute um, absolute time. So uh, there's an absolute time, there's an absolute now and an absolute time across the whole universe. Um, and so, you know, it made sense before Einstein to talk about what is happening on Mars right now. Uh, and uh, so Einstein set up his ideas using sort of uh, rods, measuring rods and, and clocks, and he defined his terms very carefully in operational in an operational way. Uh, and he was able to see that this idea of absolute simultaneity um, uh, was 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 had no place in physics. He 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 got rid of that idea. Um, so operationalism can be very successful, very useful from from a methodological point of view. Um, and for me personally, it's that methodological uh, um, use that uh, I, I find compelling. Um, I, I still personally think there is some underlying reality, and it's the job of physics to to get to that but we may have to take a circuitous route uh, to get there. So um, so that's what operationalism is. Uh, the axioms, um, you know, the idea was to try and think of some axioms or, or postulates that were somehow compelling. So, you know, because the, you can write down, you find axioms for quantum theory in the standard textbooks, but they're very ad hoc, they're very mathematical. They're not the kind of things that are 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 are, are, are immediately compelling, uh, and an historical analogy would be uh, look at, look at Kepler's laws. So Kepler had these laws for the motions of the uh, the motion of the planets. Um, so equal planets swipe out equal area in equal times, and uh, planets move in ellipses, and so on. So he had these laws, and um, they were pretty good uh, from a predictive point of view. You could predict. Uh, the motions of the planets, but they didn't seem to have an explanatory value. So, um, so something was missing, and then Newton came along, uh, and you know, with his laws of mechanics, his three laws of mechanics, and his law of universal universal gravitation, showed how how to actually do something that seemed more like it was explanatory. So he showed how you could predict these elliptical orbits and all these laws of Kepler. Uh, and actually, he did a bit more because he also showed that you could predict things like hyperbolic motion. So if you have some some comet that comes from deep outside uh, our solar system, then rather than traveling uh, on an, an ellipse around the sun, it's coming in from essentially from infinity and it travels on a, on a hyperbolic path. And that wasn't predicted by Kepler. So Newton's and Newton's laws went beyond that. And then also... Um, the planets perturb each other, and using Newton's laws, you could predict those perturbations uh, with quite a lot of success for uh, most of the planets, although interestingly, not Mercury. To understand Mercury, we had to go to Einstein and general relativity. That came along later. So um, so there's a good reason for there's a, there's a good reason for trying to come up with axioms or, or postulates which are somehow more explanatory and uh, less ad hoc. So that was the goal. Um, so let me tell you what the, what the axioms or postulates were. And I keep switching between whether they, I call them axioms or postulates. In the original paper I, I wrote in 2001, I called them axioms, but then often people think of axioms as very mathematical um, statements. Whereas what I really wanted was something that was more physical. So postulates might be a better term. So, so here, here are the postulates. Uh, well, the first one is to do with information. So, you know, if you have um, some file and you store it on a, on a memory stick or you store it on a hard drive or you store it um, 
um, you know, uh, back in the 1980s on a, on a floppy disk, um, then all those different ways of storing it are really equivalent and it doesn't matter because those, those different means of storage have the same properties. And, and you can turn that idea into an axiom. You can say that systems that have a given information carrying capacity have the same properties. Okay. So that's a statement you can make um, and you can give that precise meaning. So that's one of the assumptions. Systems that have the same information carrying capacity have the same properties. It's true in classical information theory and it's also true in quantum theory. The second um, and third axiom concern composite systems. So if I've got two, two systems, uh, then I'm interested in um, the way they behave as, as a composite. Um, so here, here's an example, again, thinking about memory sticks. If you have uh, one memory stick that has uh, can store eight gigabytes and another memory stick that can store two gigabytes, then together they can store 10 gigabytes. Okay. And um, they wouldn't, it doesn't have to be that case. It could be that when you bring two memory sticks together, they somehow discover extra storage capacity that wasn't there before. Um, but we take it as a, as a postulate that that's not true, that when you, when you have two memory sticks, um, the amount of information they store is the sum of those two, um, of the sum of the two um, memory storages for the two components. Um, so there's, there's that assumption. Um, and then there's another assumption. So I call that assumption information locality. There's another assumption called tomographic locality um, which is a very similar thing that um, that um, that when you bring two systems together, the, the number of degrees of freedom for the composite system is just is it just got from looking at the two systems separately. Okay, so it's a it's a, a similar um, principle. And then there's just just two more axioms. One of them is continuity. Okay, um, and this one works for quantum theory, and it doesn't work for, for classical probability theories. Um, so the idea is that you have a system in a definite state, and I want to get it to some other definite state. And the axiom says that you can do that in a continuous reversible fashion. So I want to go from one pure state, one, one definite state, to another definite state. Um, and I want to get there in a way that doesn't jump, but it's, it moves, it's continuous. I want to get there in a way which is reversible. So um, at any stage, I can go back. Um, and you can do that in a quantum system. The reason you can do that is, um, is because of superposition. So if I have a system in state A and it's not in state B, and then I can slowly, I can make it so it's a little bit in state B and a little bit less in state A, that's a quantum position. And I can slowly grow how much it's in state B versus state A. So I can go continuously um, from one to the other. Uh, in classical systems, if I have a system in one state and I want to get into the other state, um, then I just have to jump. I have to go from this state to the other. So in classical uh, theories, you have to jump, whereas in quantum theory, you can go continuously. So this is a striking difference between the two theories. And then the final axiom is, is a simplicity axiom. So the fifth axiom is a simplicity axiom. It says that you take the simplest theory, which is consistent with those other axioms. That that last axiom, I, I never liked it very much. Um, and it's it's um, a suitable candidate for the fifth axiom. You know that often people have sets of axioms. They, they, they have five and the last one is the one that's questionable. So the simplicity axiom is, is, is questionable. And in the meantime, lots of people, including myself, have done work um, trying to get rid of that axiom in or simplicity axiom in, in other in other sets of axioms, so yeah, so that's um, that's the the set of um, the set of postulates, and um, you know I was motivated just simply by trying to get away from this abstract nature of quantum theory. I wasn't at the time, especially thinking about quantum gravity. However, one reason for Doing this uh, it is, in fact, to, to, to think about quantum gravity, because when you start thinking about physical theories in these more general probabilistic ways, you're looking at a bigger set of possible theories and how to constrain down to a particular theory. Uh, and this is maybe a useful paradigm for thinking about quantum gravity as well. 
So that point you made about uh, continuity is fascinating to me because uh, to the li limited extent that I understand uh, <laughs> quantum theory, I always thought of, well, I've always been told that one of the key features of quantum theory is uh, the quantization of, I guess, the states of objects. So, uh, for instance, I guess take the energy levels of an electron uh, in like the orbitals of an atom, for example. That's the classic example that I'm always told in school. Uh, is there a way to get continuity in that example when the electron jumps up and down in energy level? Or is, am I understanding this wrong? Yeah, so, um, so, so, so in that system where you have an electron that can be in, I mean, the ground state of the atom, sort of roughly speaking, that's the one closest to the center, or it can be in these higher excited states. And, and if it's in a higher excited state, it will typically, um, it will, it will very quickly go down to one of the lower states. Um, um, so, um, and people often refer to that as a, as a jump, you know, as, as jumping from a higher state to a lower state. Uh, and it's not quite the same thing as what I was talking about um, um, in the sense that um, the evolution really is, 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 is continuous. But to understand an atom properly, you'd also need to include uh, um, some, um, you'd also need to include the, 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 the electromagnetic field. You've got the, the photon that's released when the atom goes down to a lower state. So really, you'd have to in include some physical degrees of freedom corresponding to the the photon that's emitted. Um, and when you when you do all of that, and you, if you look now at what happens when you start off in the excited state, and then you end up in in the in the in the in the ground state, so you you de excited. Really, what's happening is continuous. You start starting off in one state, and you go in a continuous way, evolving according to the Schrodinger equation, until you end up in another state. Um, so if you look at that properly, it's not actually a jump. It's a um, it's a it's a, a continuous transformation. So uh, thinking of this as a jump is really just a, I guess, a reductive mechanism of simplifying the, the system. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. I mean, it's often the case in physics, just generally, that a particular word is used in different contexts. And, and so you can get very, very confusing. Another example of a word like that is, is causality. People use the same word to mean all sorts of different things. Uh, and so it generally, if you really want to understand something properly, you need to understand the particular meaning of the use in that context. Uh, so, so yeah, it's everything is consistent. Um, it's not really jumping in some sense. I see. And now that you uh, bring up causality, you attempt to describe the universe without any direct reference to causality using something called the causaloid framework. Okay. Could you ex uh, explain what this is and also how this ties into the issue of quantum gravity? Okay. So, um, so first of all, um, let me explain a, a particular problem with quantum gravity as, as I see it. So when, you know, when people attack the problem of quantum gravity, usually they choose some particular problem and, and use that as a, as a way of attacking it. Um, you might think about the fact that there's a, there's a minimum distance, the Planck, the Planck length. A lot of people take that as the starting point for how to think about quantum gravity. We might choose some other feature. Um, for me, what seemed interesting was that there's this conceptual class clash um, between quantum theory and general relativity with, with regard to how they treat causality. So in, in general relativity, you have this thing called the metric. And the metric is what gives, uh, as I said before, it, what's, it's what gives you space and time. It, what's what gives you a, a measure, a metric is a measure on space and time uh, in, in the vicinity of some point. Um, so what it really conveys is, is causality. It, causality. it conveys what is before and what is after. If two points are, uh, if one point is before or after another point, if, if one point is um, at the same time called space, like separated from another point. So do two points have um, a, a time-like relationship with one another or do they have a, a space-like relationship with one another? Um, so 
so causality in general relativity is given by the metric but the metric is something you have to solve for so when you solve the equations of general relativity you have to find out what the metric is equal to it's not given to you in advance it, it's it's a thing it's a thing you have to solve you have to find it uh, and it can be different in different physical situations um so and this means that the causal structure as conveyed by the metric is dynamical <coughs> And that's that's a new feature in previous physical theories the causal structure was not dynamical so this is a new feature in general relativity and if you look at quantum theory uh, the causal structure also isn't dynamical it, it has standard quantum theory has a background space time and then you you have a background space time and you evolve a state forward in time um, general relativity doesn't have a fixed background space time um, so that's a big difference between the two theories and in, in that respect, general relativity is radical and quantum theory is conservative. But you can look at the theories in another way uh, and then, then, it, then quantum theory is the one that's radical. So quantum theory has this property of indefiniteness. So a particle can be uh, both here and here at the same time. If you ask, where is the particle? Well, the answer to that is indefinite. It's not in either place. It's in both places at the same time. You can have both things are true. Uh, and so this this property of indefiniteness doesn't happen in general relativity. It's it's a property in quantum theory. So and, and those those properties seem in the the the, the dynamical causal structure in general relativity and the indefiniteness in quantum theory seem s in some sense core to the very nature of those physical theories. That that's what makes those physical theories interesting con from a conceptual point of view. So then you might ask, well, what happens when those two things meet? Uh, so if you have indefiniteness and dynamical causal structure, um, then you're going to get indefinite causal structure. If those two things come together, um, then the causal structure itself will be indefinite. If you ask, is the causal structure this or that? The answer will be no, it's both. So you have both of them at the same time. And... Um, and that that sounds that sounds you know all well and good, but then how do you think about that? Um, and it's it's hard because normally when we think about physical theories, we imagine we have some state at a given time, and then we evolve it forward in time. So um, you know the state at time zero, and then we evolve it according to some equations to to, to later times. Um, but if you have indefinite causal structure then there isn't really any meaning to having a state at a given time. That, that, that concept stops making sense because to have a state at a given time, you need to have definite causal structure. So, um, so then the challenge, as I saw it, was to find a, a framework, a mathematical framework, which could accommodate indefinite causal structure. And so that was why I built the, um, the causaloid framework. And um, I decided to start off in a, in a very, very general way, in a very general operational uh, way. And I imagined just that you had experimentalists and they were collecting data uh, on cards. So they, you know, every time they got some, some new piece of data, they would write it on a card. Uh, and then if they got some other, another piece of data, they'd write that on a card as well. And at the end of the experiment, you'd have a big stack of cards uh, collected from different places uh, in, in this experiment during the course of this experiment. Uh, and then I, I imagine, well, let's just, all that information could be sent to uh, a man who lives inside a box uh, and it's his job to see if he can make sense of, of, um, of um, the data that's on his cards. Can he find a predictive framework um, to, to make sense of that? And um, so, so I set up a mathematical framework that this guy inside the box could use to, to make probabilistic predictions concerning data collected in that way. And the key thing, it was this was done in a way that didn't require um, uh, the notion of a state evolving in time. So that was a crucial part of, of, of that uh, endeavor. So th that was the causal aid um, framework. And it was meant to be a framework that was uh, that's hospitable to a theory of quantum gravity. Um, uh, in itself, it doesn't give you a theory of quantum gravity, but, but if you have 
the causal life framework, and then you have some additional principles, perhaps you could get to a theory of quantum gravity. That, that was the idea. So if a state uh, doesn't necessarily evolve in time, uh, what is it evolving in if it changes, or am I just not understanding this correct? Yeah, so yeah, I'd say, I'd say um, that's not the right way to think about it. Um, so to think about what a state is for in physics, generally, what, what it's for from an, operation, from an operational point of view is it's, it, you use it to help you make predictions. Okay, so you have this idea of a state at a given time and you evolve it and you might want to make predictions concerning something that happens here and something else that happens at a later time. And you can use the state as, as, a, as, a, as a tool to make those predictions. But if you have a different, if you have some different machinery that allows you to make predictions, uh, then you don't need a state at a given time. You, you can choose this other machinery as well. So, so if you are able to replace the role that a state at a given time plays by some different mathematical machinery, um, then um, then you're in, in, in a good enough situation. Then you can make predictions. And at the very least, in, 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 in um, physical theories, we want, we want to make um, predictions. I, I realize I'm using the word predictions, and it's not quite the word I want, because prediction has a sort of temporal sense to it. All I mean is, when I use the word prediction there, is is we have various bits of data and we want to, we want to be able to um, calculate probabilities concerning that data. So, you know, conditioned on this piece of data being true, what is the probability of seeing this other data over the, that, those kinds of statements? Yeah, so, so it's a very abstract, it was a very abstract endeavor in, in some ways. Um, and and, and of, of the various things I've done, it, it would, that, that's the one that's hardest to really explain in any detail without getting into the, the math. Um, it's a very abstract formalism, but it enables you to to make um, predictions in, in the sense that I just explained um, without having a uh, without having a state at a given time evolving forward in time. So, uh, in a way, this is like a reduction of possibility. Yes. Okay, that's a very good way of putting it. So the, the central tool I use in that approach is is exactly that, a reduction of, poss of possibilities. I call it compression. So um, so so um, when when you when you get this sort of data from different place parts of your experiment, and um, and you can imagine any any data, any kind of data, and um, you can imagine it with any sort of any probabilities, but if you if you want to make some if you want to to do some useful physics, you want to start narrowing that down, and and reducing the kind of amount of the the, the data you would expect to see, and, and and specifically making probabilistic predictions about that data. Um, so it turns out that you can do um, compression, which is where you narrow down the data in certain ways, and um, and, and that's the basic mathematical trick that underlies the the causal law. Uh, approach. What are some next uh, steps in your research? I've heard mention of a quantum equivalence principle. Um, how does this provide a potential road forward? Okay, so um, so I should so maybe I should first of all explain the, the Einstein's equivalence principle. Um, this is from nineteen um, oh seven. So in, in, in 1907, he, he, he realized there was this principle. He, he called it the happiest thought of his life because it was the, 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 the conceptual, the, the idea that, that, that led to general relativity. Not, not immediately. It still took him eight years, and, and he was Einstein, so that was, that was quite a while. But, um, um, but this was the key idea that led him to, to, to general relativity. And... And the, the equivalence principle, Einstein's equivalence principle, is, is this idea. You can imagine you're in an elevator, uh, and the elevator is either falling freely, um, you know, plummeting towards the um, Earth, or it's floating out in space. And imagine the elevator has no, no windows, so you don't know which situation you're, you're in. Um, well, in either of those situations, if you have some, some objects like you know, a, a ball, a, whatever, you have various objects around you, 
all those objects will be floating, appear to be floating. Now, in the case of the elevator that's out in space, they'll be floating in space with you. In the case of the elevator that's plummeting towards the Earth, they'll all be falling equally uh, with you. Uh, but those two situations appear to be the same. They're, they appear to be equivalent. So that was the equivalence principle. Um, and a different way of seeing that equivalence principle is that no matter where you are in, in, um, in the universe, you can always find a frame of reference where the laws of physics are, are inertial. And by inertial, I mean things moving in, in straight lines. Um, and uh, you can see it in those two cases, either everything is moving in a straight line um, when you're in the elevator, when it's plummeting, uh, all the straight lines are, you know, um, viewed from the outside, it would be falling to earth, but inside the elevator, it would just be straight lines of objects appearing to float inside the elevator. Or when you're floating, it's the same thing. So so you can always find a coordinate system where, where, where you have inertial behavior. This is Einstein's um, equivalence principle. So now we go to, to quantum theory. Well, if you want to come up with a quantum equivalence principle, then then you need a, a, a notion of quantum coordinate systems. Um, and um, and that kind of idea was developed by um, uh, uh, Haranov, Yakir Haranov and co-workers back in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, he called it quantum reference frames. So, so, so um, you can imagine that that um, the coordinates you use themselves are associated with quantum objects. Um, and so I, I took the idea of, of Aharonov's et al, and it's been worked on by other people uh, uh, more recently, um, 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 uh, Flaminia Giacomini and Chasla Bruckner and, and various other people. Um, uh, but I, I made it more suitable for the general relativistic context where you really want to have abstract coordinates um, that live on a, on a manifold. So, so the idea was to develop a quantum notion of coordinates. Um, so that was the first thing. And then the second thing is, well, in quantum gravity, the, the thing you want to tame is indefinite causal structure. In, in Einstein, when, when I, for, 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 the, for developing general relativity, what Einstein needed to tame was the idea of non-inertial motion. Um, and he found a way to tame that by showing that you could always find a coordinate system where the, where the motion was inertial. And that played a crucial role in deriving his field equations. So in, in the context of quantum gravity, the thing you need to tame is indefinite causal structure. So the quantum equivalence principle, the idea of that is that there always exists a quantum coordinate system uh, in the vicinity of any point such that you have definite causal structure. Okay, so it's very analogous to what Einstein did with the equivalence principle. You always have a coordinate system, so you have inertial behavior, but instead it's a quantum coordinate system and you always have um, definite causal structure. And so my hope is that that principle could play a similar constructive role in developing a theory of quantum gravity to to what the equivalence principle did in developing a, a theory of uh, Einstein's theory of um, general relativity, uh, that that's the that's the hope, and um, it's it's driven by this uh, analogy that um, you know I, I described the problem of quantum gravity earlier. The, the problem of quantum gravity is to find a theory that reduces to general relativity and to quantum theory in, in appropriate limits. Um, well. Einstein was working on a, a, an analogous problem. His problem was to find a theory that reduces to Newton's theory of gravity or to special relativity in appropriate limits. And he solved that problem by finding the theory of general relativity. Um, and he had to do that. He had to invent all sorts of new ideas. Um, and, you know, and then, and, and so, and he used the equivalence principle in, in doing that. And so, you can try to pursue an analogous technique, develop tools which are analogous to the tools that Einstein developed in in solving uh, his problem, um, but now applied to the problem of quantum gravity. So that that's the hope. Um, 
Um, and, um, you know, I feel like the idea is, is a good one, but um, I also haven't made as much progress as, as, as I hoped I would. It's, um, I'm still really stuck on some very basic um, uh, problems here. So, so that's the big goal, but uh, yeah, it turns out physics is difficult. Do you see any potential avenues through which your causaloid structure and other theories of quantum gravity, such as uh, string theory, loop quantum gravity, and uh, others um, can interrelate? Yeah, so I think it, it's possible that, that these approaches are, are complementary in, in the following sense, that um, the causal logic approach and, and the other things I've tried to do are, are really coming from this, this sort of operational uh, point of view, whereas string theory and, and loop quantum gravity start by positing mathematical structures that are motivated by more fundamental ideas, like what the fundamental constituents of of, of space time and uh, uh, are made out of. So um, you could think of it as as um, trying to build a, a bridge um, between two shores. Uh, and, you know, you've got the operational shore on the one hand. Which is where you're 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 looking at what you actually see experiments, and you've got this sort of fundamental uh, shore on the other end, and uh, you're trying to build a bridge between the two of them. And um, the hope is that um, that that the two things can meet up in some sense um, in, in the middle. Um, so that that that's that's an optimistic um, viewpoint. It, it may be that the you know the two bridges are built and they completely miss each other, and end up um, <laughs> uh, you end up with two bridges, um, um, which, which wouldn't be such a bad thing. But uh, but, um, but you want you want at least one one way of thinking that, that works. So yeah, that that's possible. Um, I haven't interacted with the the string theory community um, um, so much, at least so far as these ideas are concerned. Um, I've been interacting more with the the loop quantum gravity community. There's there's an initiative uh, funded by Templeton. It's called the Quantum Information Structure of Space Time Initiative, and um, and uh, people like Carla Ravelli and Laurent Fidel are, are involved in that. And so we've been having meetings. Um, I mean, this is this is this is this is um, interfacing people who are working on quantum foundations pursuing sort of ideas like the ideas I've been pursuing uh, and people from the quantum gravity community um, talking to one another. So um, so I'm hoping something good will come out of that. Um, it's still early days, I think. That uh, concludes the technical portion of the interview. Uh, I'd like to perhaps discuss some of the broader uh, implications of your work. Um, and being someone who's very interested in philosophy, um, one of the first things that my mind comes to when looking at your work is, is that um, I see the lines of like physics and philosophy being increasingly blurred because historically uh, causality is something that most sciences have simply assumed. Um, and if you, if you do science, you just uh, assume causality. And if you want to examine the nature of causality itself, then uh, that would be sort of in the realm of philosophy. Uh, and I, I understand that, that this isn't really like a formal question, but I'd love to hear, uh, you know, your thoughts on the subject as to this, I guess, merging of uh, scientific and philosophical thought. Yeah, so, I mean, I come from this background in quantum foundations. Um, I, I did a, a degree in physics, um, and then I wanted to think about quantum foundations. And, um, you know, at the time, this was in the, the late 1980s, um, there the, the really weren't many places in physics departments that were doing this. Uh, I, I was lucky to find um, my supervisor, Ewan Squires, in, in, a, in a physics department. Uh, and um, I was able to do a PhD on, in quantum foundations. Now, at, at that time, the community of quantum foundations was made up really of people from a physics background who were managing somehow to forge a career uh, and people in in philosophy departments so 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 when we had conferences we, we would meet and uh, that was that was the nature of, of the field um, and in fact it, it, it goes back to before then so 
So you may know that the Nobel Prize um, um, just just last year was won by people uh, doing research on on quantum foundations. So especially um, doing uh, doing experiments to test Bell's theorem. Um, so John Bell um, had had to come up with his theorem in in 1964. Uh, his theorem showed that that um, uh, quantum theory is in some sense um, a non-local. So even though um, you cannot signal between two distant uh, locations, if, if those two locations share uh, a quantum state, um, there's a sense in which um, you can't explain these correlations you see uh, as if information had been locally shared. There's essential, there's something non-classical about this. So it's a very profound result. Um, and so he, he, he did that in... in um, in 1964, and then a few years later, um, um, he was approached by a, a group of people, which included Abner Shimoni, who was a who, who was a, a philosopher, uh, and John Clauser, who was one of the people awarded the Nobel Prize this year. John Clauser um, um, did the first experimental test of Bell's inequalities. Uh, and so John Clauser uh, and uh, Abner Shimoni and, and a few other people, uh, uh, Mike Horn and, and, and Holt, um, were working on making John Bell's uh, theoretical ideas uh, amenable to experiment, actually showing how to do an experiment. Um, and, and Abner Shimoni, the philosopher, uh, referred to what they were doing as experimental metaphysics. So this idea that you were trying to test some deep conceptual ideas, and you were going to do an experiment to test that. And so that was what led to the first the first experiment to test um, Bell's ideas um, and, um, and and the Nobel Prize. Um, and so it was this meeting of, of philosophy and, and physics. And I think Bell's theorem in particular had a big impact on, 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 on these communities uh, and a big impact on, on my own uh, career as well. So, um, so I haven't really answered your question uh, at the level of the subject matter so much as at the level of, of, of the way the communities were working and talking to one another. Um, but that, that continues. So the Quantum Foundations community continues to be um, made up of people from physics and people from philosophy. You know, we continue to talk to each other. Um, you know, um, and uh, if you go to a conference, you'll have people from a philosophy background as well as a physics background. And, um, and that's great. It means you have a, a different perspective um, uh, on on these same questions. Yeah, um, I actually had the pleasure of uh, interviewing a close associate of uh, Alain Aspe, mm -hmm. who was one of the people who won the Nobel Prize this year. Uh, his name was uh, Doctor Serge Massar. I'm not sure if you. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know him. Yes, yes, very well. Yeah, and. Uh, yeah, he was telling me about his work on Bell's theorem, mm -hmm. uh, and he actually mentioned uh, your work on uh, Hardy's paradox as a uh, example of quantum non-locality. Yeah. So, yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We're, very, we're very much part of the same community. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. He was actually the first interview. I oh, really? Had. Right. Well, that's a good, a good yeah. start. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, Finally, uh, I'd like to go back to how you uh, reformulated quantum theory starting from the five axioms. Uh, in mathematics, there are always uh, true statements which you cannot prove starting from the axioms. This is the famous Gödel theorem. Do you think a similar thing could be true for physics? Yeah, so I, you, you, you sent me uh, some of these questions in advance, and, and, and this was the question I was most worried about because, um, you know, I mean, I, 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 from, from, from time to time, I've thought about this, and I've never really um, known how to make any sense of this this issue. So yes, so there's there's Gödel's theorem. So in you know, it, which is really just a result in mathematics. You have a mathematical system which uh, of, of axioms, and it, it doesn't have to have very much structure. Really, just uh, it has to contain the integers and a little more structure. Then you can you can um, write down in that system statements which you know to be true but there's no way of proving the truth of those statements within the mathematical system that you've written down. Okay, so that's Gödel's, um, um, Gödel's theorem. Um, Gödel always worried that it was it was just a, a sort of version of the, the liar paradox. Um, 
and um, I mean, the, 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 the key statement is a self-referential statement, the key statement that he constructs, which you, has to be true by virtue of the way it's constructed, uh, but you can't prove it to be true, is, is self-referential. Um, so, so physics is a bit different. It's not, it's not constrained just to the sort of platonic world of mathematical statements. It, it reaches out into the world. So physical theory, you'd have a set of axioms or, or, or postulates and the job of those postulates is to make um, predictions uh, about about the world itself. Okay, so it sort of reaches across, it reaches outside itself in, into the world. Uh, and so, if you were to search for, for something which was analogous, uh, like what you're suggesting, then I think what you would want would be some statement about the world, which you knew to be true, but you couldn't predict that it was true from the physical postulates she'd written down. So a statement about the world that was true, but your physical theory couldn't predict that it was true. Um, that would be something like an analogy to Gödel's um, theorem. Um, and does something like that exist? Um, and I have to admit, this, this, this made me start thinking about consciousness. Uh, you, know, we, you know, I know I'm conscious, I, I, but I also can't imagine how I would ever prove that was, I was conscious in the context of any set of um, of, um, of axioms. Um, however, I, I also, and, and also the, the consciousness has a certain self-referential quality to it. Um, but I don't think that quite works as, a, as an analogy because uh, Gödel's theorem, really you know, any set of mathematical uh, axioms, as long as they're just have enough structure to include the, the, the integers and a few more things uh, will, will give rise to this. Whereas, uh, Whereas, you know, physical theories don't have to concern um, conscious beings. So I'm not sure if that's quite enough, or that that's quite analogous. Uh, but but your question did make me think of that, that issue. Um, yeah, so I don't really know. I, I can't think of how you would do it. I can't think of what Gödel's statement, you could write down, you could try to construct a statement like Gödel's statement, but in the context of a set of physical postulates. But I'm not sure what, what that would mean. Um, and so I don't really have a good, um, I don't have an answer to that question, but I, I think it's a, it's a fun, th a fun thing to think about. Um, and it's always fun to think about consciousness, um, uh, if, if it takes you in that direction. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, yeah, those were basically all of the questions I had. Thank you so much for appearing on the podcast again. Right. Um, you're very welcome. It was, it was, a, it was a lot, a lot of fun. <laughs>